We can hear blood curling screams coming from a female voice coming from the distance. And we pull out our guns immediately and we just start running towards the sound of the screams. Eventually we have to crawl underneath this outside stairwell and we get into this open courtyard, just two story attached condominiums all around us. We get to right in front of the condominium where the screaming is coming from and it goes dead silent, literally from blood curling screams to just eerie silence. I know I've got more officers coming on the way, but we've got to get inside. Impact of trauma, lives of police officers, their families, and the courage it takes to overcome. On episode 20 of The Silent Struggle, we focus our discussion on the story of a police sergeant and his journey to fight for survival following the on-duty shooting death of an armed subject. I am Robert Asensio. I am joined with my partner, co-host, David Magnuson, retired police chief. And we are joined by internationally best-selling author, retired police sergeant, Air Force captain veteran, Michael Sugru. How are you, Michael? Doing great. How about you guys? Good. Thank well, you. Thank, thank you for joining you. us. Oh, it's my pleasure. So, Michael, let's get right into it. Let's take you back to December 27th, 2012. You're working for the Walnut Creek Police Department. You're on patrol. You get dispatched to a burglary in progress of an armed subject. Can you take it from there? Absolutely. So... Brand new patrol sergeant, you know, graveyard shift. Shift started right after Christmas and literally just a few hours from going off duty. And this call comes out of a woman barricaded inside a condominium and a man armed with a knife. Immediately, I throw my car and drive. I'm driving as fast as I can to get there. Other units are responding. It's in a high residential area, apartments, condos. Um, I know the area, but I don't know this exact unit. About halfway there, the dispatcher gets on the radio very frantic, and she says, now the boyfriend and girlfriend are barricaded inside their bedroom. And so I was a bit confused, and I actually asked for clarification on the radio and asked if the boyfriend was the one with the knife or was there a third subject inside the condo armed with the knife. And she quickly clarified, no, there's a third subject armed with the knife. And so now just all these thoughts are racing through my head trying to get there as fast as I can. Literally, I pull up on scene in front of this large complex. It's very dark. As I start to get out of my patrol car, the dispatcher starts screaming on the radio saying, units, units, there's a struggle, there's a struggle. And then suddenly she says the phone line goes dead and she loses all contact inside that condominium. At that same moment, thank goodness, one of my officers pulls up right behind me. And we can hear blood curling screams coming from a female voice coming from the distance. And we pull out our guns immediately and we just start running towards the sound of the screams. Eventually we have to crawl underneath this outside stairwell and we get into this open courtyard, just two story attached condominiums all around us. We get to right in front of the condominium where the screaming is coming from and it goes dead silent, literally from blood curling screams to just eerie silence. I know I've got more officers coming on the way, but we've got to get inside that condo. We don't know if that couple is being killed, if they've already been killed, they're bleeding out, but we've got to get in there. So we announce ourselves several times, nothing, no movement, no sound. Eventually, my partner notices a huge window the size of a door, a louvered window that's completely shattered into the condominium. And so again, we announce ourselves at this broken window, nothing. My partner goes in first. I'm right behind her. Immediately, we're in this kitchen area, just glass everywhere. We exit the kitchen. She goes right. I go left. I clear the family room, dining room area. I don't see anybody. No signs of a disturbance. Immediately, I join her back at the bottom of the stairwell. So literally, there's the locked front door right behind us. We're shoulder to shoulder. She is to my right. And there's a solid wall to her right. And we're looking up this dark stairwell. Our guns are out. Lights are illuminated. And we're yelling, police, police, come out. Show us your hands. Show us your hands. Nothing. And this seems like eternity when it's happening. But literally, this all happens very quickly. 
suddenly a male subject comes out at the top of the staircase and we can't see the entire right side of his body, just sweating profusely, eyes wide open, literally staring straight through us like a zombie. And again, we're yelling at him, show us your hands, show us your hands. Nothing. I don't remember any body movement, no facial expressions, no words were exchanged. I don't even remember the subject's eyes blinking. At some point, two more officers arrive on scene and they come inside the condominium. I yell for one of them to get the taser, less than lethal force, and the male officer says, I've got the taser. He positions right behind myself and that other first officer on scene. So three of us are at the bottom of the staircase. The fourth officer goes perpendicular to the staircase. Moments later, the male subject fully comes out. My partner yells, he's got a knife, he's got a knife. And in his right hand, he was clenching a full-size kitchen knife, huge knife. And so now, again, guns out, pointed at him, we're yelling, drop the knife, drop the knife. No reaction. Again, no movement, no nothing. Suddenly, he takes the knife up over his head in a stabbing position, starts coming towards us. I shoot. Other officers shoot. I don't know if I've hit him. He's now at the bottom of the staircase. Two of the officers retreated to the family room, living room area. The male officer that had tried to tase, he dropped his taser, now has his firearm out. And literally, myself and this one officer are just a few feet from the subject at the bottom of the staircase. I don't see any blood. I don't see any wounds. But he's still clenching this huge kitchen knife. And all we know is he's between us and the couple upstairs. And we've got to get to them. We've got to save their lives. And so, again, literally, we're yelling at him, drop the knife, drop the knife. He starts coming back up with the knife. There's no nice way to say it, but, you know, we shot. Inst instantly, he was killed. I mean, his wounds were absolutely devastating. His eye was gone. I mean, just blood everywhere. We already had medical staging, and I had dispatch send in medical. We checked for vitals. There were none. I had officers go up and check on that couple, and thank God we got there and we did because this subject had been stabbing through their bedroom door with this huge knife, and literally the door was coming off the hinges, and this poor couple was physically barricading their body against that door, trying to prevent him from coming in. Harrowing. What do you think, Chief? Oh, r riveting. I mean, uh, plays out step by step. You, you, can, you can feel it. As, as he as he's saying it, what's what's going to happen, uh, you know, and it, and what takes place next? I mean, this is just the beginning. Yeah, this is yeah. just the beginning. I mean, as as odd as that may seem, for people that haven't been in law enforcement or haven't had a uh, discharge of firearm, um, now it's now the drama is going to begin. Which, before we go there, before we go into the next part of the story, um, you know, for the like like. Like David said, for the person who's never been involved in a shooting, uh, you're walking us through some detailed information. And I thank you for being so courageous and sharing the story in the detail that you did. Because there were some things that you just mentioned that really popped at me. The amount of detail that you focused in on, no blinking, wide eyes, you see the side of his you know, part of his side is turned to you, raising the arm, lunging at you guys, the knife. Also, the color of the knife, if I recall correctly, wasn't it like a bluish tint to the knife or something to that effect? That you it know? was. It was a large blue ceramic kitchen knife. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're going through an unnatural act at the moment. You know, you're hyper focused. You, all your training comes in. And I would suspect that some of your military background comes in, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. Um, let's talk about. If you remember the split decision of shoot, don't shoot, like when you realize this is a threat, an imminent threat to me, the officers, to life. Can you talk about that? What was going through your head and the decision to take that shot? Absolutely. I, I just remember the entire time when I was yelling at him to drop that knife, I was in my heart just hoping, praying he was going to listen to me, that he was going to drop this knife. And, you know. Oddly enough, and, and at this point, you know, I'd been a civilian police officer for eight years, prior military six and a half years, and 99.9% .9 of the time, 
in these kind of deadly threat situations with somebody holding a knife, holding a gun. And I've been involved in these in the past. You know, they comply. Eventually, they drop the knife or they run away. Um, but at this point, I just remember as soon as that knife started coming up, and, and it's it's kind of like super focused vision. All I saw was the tip of that knife coming directly at me. And literally, in a blink of a second, I saw my life literally flashing before my eyes. And I thought I was going to be killed. In that moment, that literally was the closest I'd ever come to being killed. And in fact, that moment forever changed that feeling of invincibility that I had. I mean, up to this point, you know, I was undercover for two years on the state drug task force. Let's talk about that, Michael. Let's talk about your background in, in narcotics and your undercover work, the, the, the great good that you did. And then we'll ask some questions and maybe go sure. into your little bit of your military background sure. to give the audience a better sense of who you are. Absolutely. So, you know, in the Air Force, I was security forces, and that's basically anti-terrorism, force protection, air base ground defense, nuclear security, foreign air fuel assessments. Um, I was also a Phoenix Raven which is a specialized subset of security forces members that deploy with air crew aircraft to high threat, high danger areas. And they're directly responsible for the safety of that air crew and that aircraft. And so I did that for six and a half years, literally all over the world. I was in the Middle East, South America, Europe, all over the United States. So I go into civilian law enforcement, you know, patrol officer, eventually field training officer, detective. And then I was undercover on a California state drug task force. So basically like the California version of the DEA. And we were tasked with targeting mid to high level drug dealers and drug traffickers. And literally, I mean, this, that assignment was a dream come true, but in reality, it was probably the most dangerous thing I'd ever done. I mean, literally we were doing high risk entries like a SWAT team would, but we were doing it as our own team. Mm -hmm. And we were doing it sometimes, you know, multiple times a day. And definitely, you know, four to five times a week. And we're going into the most dangerous homes with known armed drug dealers, literally guns out. You know, these people are literally sometimes in their bed still. And we're going into their sanctuary, their kingdom, and we're ordering them on the ground. We're cuffing them up, you know. And in those, all those instances, you know, people complied. I mean, sure, people fought, people ran. But, you know, fast forward, I eventually leave that assignment. Now I'm just back on patrol. In the city of Walnut Creek, which is a nice city, um, it's a destination area for shopping, for dining, you know, lo low crime. And I've been in the worst areas of Northern California, you know, undercover. Now here I am back in one of the safest cities, right? And here comes this call out of nowhere because this stuff can happen anytime, at any point. doesn't matter where you work, who you are. And I'm now faced with the most dangerous situation I'd ever been involved in, in both the military and in civilian law enforcement. David, that's something that you can relate a lot to. Yeah, I mean, I've worked the uh, undercover units, city of Miami, uh, primarily drugs, but we also had sat up on robbery, uh, which was ended up being my, my favorite part of, uh, of law enforcement. Uh, stakeouts, you know, you're going to run across bad people. And, and you're right about this. The, the compliance level was, was pretty good. You had enough people with you. You usually had to drop on them, you know, like offense and football. You know where you're going to cut. Uh, makes it a little bit more difficult for the defender. Um, but, yeah, they usually did comply. If not, they took off running mm -hmm. and they got caught. Uh, but, yeah, you, you make a very interesting point. It's the less, it seems to me, the less, quote, unquote, dangerous areas and stuff is where things go off the deep end quickly. Um and maybe domestic related or have somebody where somebody knows the, uh, the, the potential victim or they know the suspect or things along those lines, even the ambushes that could go on on a, on a uh, seemingly innocuous call. Uh, but yeah, I could certainly relate to, to what you were talking about. You, you do make a very sound point with that. Yeah. So. Well, let me ask you, you both of you guys a question, you know, high liability incidents take a toll on you, right? We, you, you generally hypervigilance for sure. Exactly. Yeah. You're, you're in a mode in the yellow to red mode, right? Always where, where you're on guard, head on a swivel for what's going to come next. But year after year after year, all these things take a little 
like they chipping away at at the officers, the military, at the person that's out there, the frontline work, worker, right? Now you have an incident where you have to take action. In your case, Michael, you had to confront an armed subject that was an imminent threat, not just to you, your partner, but the people that he was accosting, and you take the shot. What impact did that have on your life? I know it had it's had some impact on you. I know it's had some impact on me. But let's talk about you, Michael. What impact did that have on your life? Um, it was huge. But to take a step back to explain it a little bit further, um, you know, up to this point, you know, six and a half years in the military, eight years civilian law enforcement at the time of my shooting, I had been exposed and involved in hundreds and hundreds of traumatic incidents from you know, child deaths, child abuse, suicides, homicides, domestic violence, um, horrible car accidents, you know, fatal car accidents. And the issue was that I never dealt with those things. I just pushed them away, bottled them up, and eventually they kept piling up and piling up and piling up. And, and the best way to look at this is that this shooting was my tipping point. This is where my jar, it overflowed. It got too much. And for me, this was my breaking point. And so it wasn't just the shooting, but it was the hundreds and hundreds of incidents and the almost shootings that I was involved in up to this point. And so, you know, the shooting happens and immediately a whole series of administrative things happen, you know, dual investigations. You know, I'm being interrogated by the district attorney's office, by our own internal affairs investigators. And literally, I'm a suspect in a homicide at this point. And so I'm being investigated. My rights are being read to me. You know, my fingerprints are being taken, checked for gun residue, my my duty belt and equipment's being taken. I'm put off work. Um, you know, I, I'm ordered not to talk about this with anybody. And in this point, which we haven't brought up yet, there was a lawsuit filed almost immediately from the family members of the person that tried to kill us. So even though this was a fully justified shooting, even though we saved not only the two people's lives upstairs, but fellow officers we were sued and eventually that lawsuit drug on for almost four years. Eventually, you know, I ended up a defendant in federal court in San Francisco. So this event that I so wanted to forget, you know, these nightmares that I was having, I couldn't get this face, this image of this man that tried to kill me out of my dreams. Literally my life just started spiraling downward. And I had to remember every finite detail of this because we were being sued. And again, we were ordered not to talk about this. And then we were facing deposition after deposition, you know, court hearings, just all these things. And it got to the point where literally I didn't want to be here anymore. It was so bad that I literally wanted to die in the line of duty. I started purposely putting myself in dangerous situations, hoping a bad guy killed me at work. It has to take its toll. It's constant. It's over and over again. Then it went to civil. Uh and you can't get it out of your mind because you have to remember the facts. You you know, they you certainly don't want to stray from what you know what you said. The facts are the facts, but you have to keep going over and over. You can't even heal. And Michael, that's why I asked about what the impact, right? Because for the benefit of the audience, for anybody that will see this video, right? This interview, this conversation, which is very honest. Very few people that go through these incidents. We'll have the courage to discuss it in, in the detail that you do. Um, but how how many times is this repeated in law enforcement? And I and I bring that up for the benefit of the people who are the audience. You know, if you really truly support law enforcement and the people that are out there protecting you, please consider what they go through and the price they pay for serving and protecting. Now, let's go back to the story here, Michael, because your story doesn't end there, right? You, I, I believe you, pre you prevail or you do prevail in court, but it's not just about prevailing in court. It's prevailing in life. I mean, you're struggling to survive. So you mentioned about your, your question as to whether to live or not, right? You're placing yourself in high liability situations. Mm -hmm. Um, What's your turning point? When do you realize and why do you realize that you need to address this demon that's before you? So our trial finally ended. So the shooting was December 27, 2012. The trial took place in September 2016. 
And we prevailed, like you said. Um, Judge Breyer, the brother of Supreme Court Justice Breyer that just retired, he even said on the record, had it not been for our actions, more lives would have been lost that night. But here's the thing, you know, when I was sitting there in court for two full weeks, literally having a jury stare at me every single day and having the plaintiffs who brought in these crazy expert witnesses who were saying that we planted evidence, that this guy was never armed, that we were cold blooded murderers. I mean, literally. And what I didn't tell you yet is that this guy, the guy that tried to kill me, he had an identical twin brother and he was in the courtroom. And so this face that I couldn't get out of my nightmares for four years was literally there every single day in the courtroom, just a few feet behind me. And we would break for, you know, 10 minutes to go use the restroom. The family members of the man that tried to kill me were lined in the hallway. And I had to worry about when I took a bathroom break, were one of these people going to come in there and try to attack me or try to take me out? And so, you know, this whole process of waiting for this lawsuit that four years I had told myself, I, I kind of said, you know what, this is the problem. This lawsuit is hanging over me. I blamed everything on that. And I told myself, hey, as long as we prevail, all my problems are going to go away. My life's going to magically get better. But that morning I woke up after the trial ended, it got much, much worse because my nightmares increased. I started to doubt myself, even though I know I saved lives, even though I know I had no choice, I started thinking, what if I would have paused here? What if I would have waited there? What, you know, magical thinking that wasn't realistic. But that's where I got to the point where really I wanted to die in the line of duty. And so, again, September 2016. Now go a couple weeks after Thanksgiving or a week after Thanksgiving 2016. So a few months later, I'm on duty. I'm the day shift patrol sergeant getting ready to go home. And a suicide in progress comes out. It turns out. It's my best friend's house. This man, John, was a Vietnam veteran, but he was also a 35-year reserve officer with my department, and we rode together all the time. Well, he literally tried to kill himself at home, and I got to the trauma center just as the ambulance brought him in. He was covered in blood. He had stabbed himself in the torso, slit both wrists, OD'd on multiple prescription medications, and I literally had 30 seconds before they rushed him off to surgery. And I looked him in the eyes and I said, John, you're going to make it. You're going to pull through this. But my heart, I didn't think he had a chance. I was like, there's no way he's going to survive this. And I remember sitting in the hospital and this is what happened. I was sitting in the hospital for hours with my administrators, with my friend, John's sister who had driven up. And I just felt this overwhelming sense of guilt as to why I didn't see the signs that my own best friend was suffering. I had no idea that he would have ever done something like this. You know, he never talked about the Vietnam War. He never talked about his post-traumatic stress injury. And while sitting there, all I could think about was my six-year-old daughter at the time. And what was going to be the effect on her if she found out that I killed myself or if I died in the line of duty? What's going to be the domino effect on her? And so a month after that, and thank God he survived because John saved my life by trying to take his own life. And a month after that, on the anniversary of my shooting, 2016, December 27, 2016, I finally got the strength and courage to ask for help. And that is where everything changed for me. And, you know, and, and during this time, too, I understand you were doing uh, with loved ones that were, were ill. And uh, I know I think offline we had that discussion on the closeness of, uh, you know, with your, with your father. Uh, that's. You know, you, all the all these things come into play, um, and I think what I think oftentimes what what gets lost in in the mix for civilian population, and it's not an us versus them. That's not it at all. But while you're having to deal with these issues that came your way because of this person's actions, you still have the other issues that go on in everybody's lives, whether it's family related, whether it's personal, marriage related. Everything compounds. Um, but going back to your point here, I mean, what you just said, you know, you you saved your own life, you know, uh, John being able, you know, by trying to take his, it saved yours. That's yes. that's that's pretty deep. That's pretty deep. Does he know that? Have you spoken to him about that? Uh, you know, I, he still has guilt and shame over that. And, mm -hmm. and we talk almost every week and I remind him of that fact. And, you know, in fact, in, in our new book that came out, he, he has his own chapter and he talks about 
his experience in Vietnam, he talks about his suicide attempt. And, and I told him, I said, John, you know, by sharing your story, you're saving lives. I mean, yeah, you saved my life, but now you're saving countless lives. And he's been in a documentary. He's in the book. And, and, and I'll tell you what, I mean, he is the most courageous, bravest person that I know. And thank God he pulled through that because like I said, he absolutely saved my life. So let's talk about your book real quick. So yeah, yeah. Relentless Courage, Winning the Battle Against Frontline Trauma, co-authored with Dr. Shauna Springer, a PhD. She's a clinical psychologist, a Harvard graduate. She's already written three other books. Phenomenal, phenomenal person. She's a culturally competent clinician. But yeah, this book is very unique. I'm going to tell you why. As far as I know, there is not a single book like this in the world. And the reason why is every chapter is split into two parts. The first part of every chapter is my story told in my voice going all the way back to childhood. But the second half of every chapter, Doc Springer comes in. She breaks everything down. She explains it. She explains why. I'm having the feelings or thoughts that I'm having. She's explaining the physical and mental impacts of the things that we have to endure, both in our personal lives, in our work lives. And she does it in a way that is very easy to understand that anybody, so anybody could pick up this book. In fact, I had my daughter read it when she was 11 years old and she was so engrossed in it, but she understood everything. And Doc Springer basically is able to show the human side behind the badge and behind the uniform. And so this book is not just for military members. It's not for first responders. It's not just for their loved ones, spouses, children. This book is for everybody out there. And it literally will rock your world. Once you start it, you will not be able to stop. David, you you have it right here. I, here it is. I got it the other day. I went through it. And I, it just uh, true to your words. I mean, uh, your points were riveting. And then you go over to, to Doc Springer and what she has to say. And uh, it ties up the loose ends. It gives you a perspective there uh, from somebody that can speak from experience. So it, it makes a great deal of sense. Uh, I, you know, I enjoyed it. Uh, I would certainly recommend it. Uh, but, just, you know, we got relentless courage. I think the word that jumps out at me more than it is relentless. It's relentless. You just got to go after it. You know, you got that courage, like like most of law enforcement does. That courage to do what most people don't, and the military as well. Relentless. Keep yeah. driving forward. Keep driving forward, even when uh, when it's darkest. You know, it's always darkest before the dawn, so they say. Uh, but you know, it it's inspiring too, uh, especially the the part where you talk about John and how you were able to. Uh, you know, what, what, what dawned on you, you know, finally what you needed to do. Uh, so there is an inspiration behind that too. And I certainly recommend the book for anybody suffering out there in silence, because normally we have our brothers and sisters out there, um, whether in law enforcement, military, first responders, or even the public suffering, what, what advice would you give them? Absolutely. So there's two things. Um, one of the biggest mistakes I made in my career was at the very beginning um, I told myself that I would never bring, bring work home. I would never talk about the job with my family or loved ones. And by doing that, I created a, a barrier between my then spouse. You know, I ended up getting a divorce through this nightmare process. Um, I created a divide between us. But when I came home in a bad mood or pissed off, you know, my family was walking on eggshells because they didn't realize it was a horrific car accident or child death that I had to deal with that day. They thought it was them. You know, they thought, they thought I was just pissed off in a bad mood. And, and so I didn't do the job of communicating, hey, you know, here's what happened today. Not in graphic detail, but enough to let them know that, hey, you know, I've been affected. I just need a little time to decompress, a little space, and then we can re-engage and we can talk about it. So that was the biggest mistake. But, you know, while I was suffering for that four years, literally four years in darkness where literally I was losing everything. My health was failing. I lost my, my father, my hero. My marriage was over. I mean, you name it, it was going, right? And so during that time, I thought I was the only one. I thought there was nobody out there that would understand what I was going through. I thought people would judge me. I thought something was wrong with me. And I didn't realize until I, until I started my recovery process that actually there's countless brothers and sisters out there who do get it, who do understand it. And I'm talking about not just law enforcement and military, but I'm talking about firefighters, paramedics, dispatchers. 
we all have to deal with these same horrific scenes and issues. And, you know, one thing that we haven't brought up that is detailed in the book is when our own, you know, red family, blue family, green family turn their back on us. And I call that institutional betrayal or administrative betrayal. And so all these things are affecting us, but we don't talk about it. But I want people to know there's endless resources out there. And we have many resources listed in the back of our book from, you know, confidential text lines, hotlines that you can call 24 seven to literally week long retreats and projects that you can do that don't cost you any money that literally will change your life. will let you see that you're not alone, that these feelings you're having are actually normal. It's a normal reaction to all the abnormal things that we have to see and deal with. But I want people to know I'm living proof as dark as it got for me. I'm living a whole new life now, a phenomenal life, a better life than I ever have. And I want people to know that it, it wasn't easy. It took a lot of work. There was good days and bad days, but I promise you and I assure you, if you take that hardest step and you raise your hand and ask for help, there will be people there to help you. Michael touched upon it earlier. I think we've touched upon it in the past. Uh, we do see things that nobody should really see. And we probably see them at a far greater clip than most people know. Uh, yes, you had your incident. We've had our incidents. Uh, but we've also... I've, been on countless scenes where I've seen people just die with their eyes open talking that they didn't want to die and they're sitting, you know, and they're robbery offenders, you know, and they crashed and, and you just see things like that. Or you see like a mother running out because her, her child was gunned down in the street and you see that time after time after time. And the point which we make to is like, you never want to get to a point where it doesn't bother you anymore because it should, it should bother you, but you need to be able to balance that. Cause if you ever get that cold that, Oh, it's just one more person shot. Who cares? This may not be the job for you anymore. Yeah. It's so true. Yeah. You know, for me, reflecting on what you said, Michael, and what you said, David, um, it's really trying to convey to the public that our public servants are not machines. They're humans that they experience the same as the next person, and just as you mentioned, I use your words, the higher clip, mm -hmm. right? And to please understand that these are human beings that are asked to do extraordinary feats. It's, it's an honorable job to publicly serve, or serve, honorably serve, but let's be honest, man, it, it, it is without doubt, non almost unnatural. Right? It's unnatural to put the stress that we put on our military and first responders and, and anyone that's out there serving the public. So we just ask for you to better understand the people who are serving you. We have about a minute left. Michael, any, any closing thoughts? And one, two questions. Any closing thoughts? And the other question is for our audience, anyone that wants to get a hold of you, anyone that wants to buy the book, which we encourage everyone to read it, please let them know. Yeah, so the book is on Amazon. It's on Kindle, paperback, hardcover. The Audible was released a uh, year after the book came out, and it's in our own voice, straight from the heart. Um, literally, it's like you're there in the experience, and so I highly, highly recommend the Audible version. Um, but yeah, you know, we poured, Doc Spring and I poured our heart and soul into this book with one mission, and that's to impact and save as many lives as we can. And I want people, if they do read this, if they do listen to it, I want to hear from you. I want you to reach out to me. I'm on pretty much every social media platform out there from LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Threads, TikTok, I mean, Parlor Truth, you name it. I want to hear from you. So if you do read it, if you do listen to it, please send me a message. And I promise to you, I will reply to you. From one brother, two brothers, from an opposite side to the nation. Opposite Coats, we thank you. To the Millers, Michael, Grant, Miller, Miami's Community News, to our audience, we thank you. Michael, thank you for coming on. David, always a pleasure to work with you, brother. Thank you. And you, the audience, we couldn't do this without you.